Welcome, Ken Burns, a uh, friend of New Orleans, a friend of Tulane. Welcome back. And a friend of Walter Isaacson. Thank you. It's been five years since I've been here, I think, talking with oh, really? you last time, and yeah. COVID interrupted a lot. You know, there are very few p innovators who've totally invented something new, and you've done that over the years with the notion of the documentary based on still pictures, based on talks. Uh, it's amazing. And what got you for the first time to a non-American Leonardo da Vinci? Well, we're going to see some of it, so don't panic. Yeah, so, so here's the thing. I was working with um, a really noted American author who is concentrated on kind of geniuses and innovators. Uh, <laughs> Over the, and, and I had agreed kind of willingly that I would dive into Benjamin Franklin and that he would provide an interview. It's not, we don't ever do anybody's book. We talk to lots of different scholars. And we were having dinner uh, one night in Washington, D.C. At, at a lovely restaurant with some friends. And all of a sudden, Walter started, I can only describe as like one of the most significant bait and switches in my professional life. <laughs> ever. He started talking about how, you know, Franklin and Leonardo are really not that different. If you think about it, one's, one, they're both great scientists, they're both great artists, you know. Uh, 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 Franklin has a felicity with the pen and with the ability to write. You know, uh, Leonardo as a painter and a drawer, a sketcher, all of this sort of stuff. And I'm going, Walter, you know, I've been making films for now for almost 50 years and they're all in America. I mean, I am like Guam or Samoa. I'm a, an American possession. This is what I'm interested in. This is what animates me. And, and it was kind of like, you know, and he pushed a lot too, which was, it was not bordering on rudeness. We're old friends. Um, but, you know, I kind of went out and I was like shaking my head. So I call my uh, daughter, Sarah, my oldest daughter, um, and I had been collaborating with her and her husband, David McMahon, for many years on films like the Central Park Five, on Jackie Robinson. Most recently, we were working on Muhammad Ali, and beyond there, we were looking to a big post-Civil War history called From Emancipation to Exodus, that it would take us from what it sounds like to the beginning of the great black migration out of uh, the South for the next six decades, beginning at the end of the second day. So we, our, our dance card is full. And I called in and, and Sarah said, how was dinner with Walter? I said, it was great, but he was trying to sell me on Leonardo. And she goes, we'll do it. Great thing about daughters. <laughs> the, the great thing about oldest daughters, when she was a year and a half old, a year and a half old, I left her alone in a room, because I could without any worrying, and went into the kitchen and said to her mom, who was making dinner, I said, I think she runs our family, and I think I'm okay with that. And she <laughs> said, she said, yes. So when Sarah said, we'll do it, they did it. And so Sarah and Dave and I have been working for many, many years, uh, thanks to Walter's persistence, on a biography of one of the most interesting and I mean in my Jefferson film which I made in 1997 George Will said that despite the flaws it was possible to suggest that we we're then at the end of the of the millennium not into this new one he said that you could consider Jefferson one of the men of the millennium which immediately makes you think well who else why aren't there women you know is it Shakespeare is it Mozart is it Bach you know who's who's really there Having done this film, I am so stunned about this. Sarah and Dave moved um, for an entire year, my, two of my grandkids, to Florence. They lived and breathed Leonardo for a full year, and then we've been editing for the last year. We've just locked the picture, so whatever we show today will have a few watermarks in it. It's unmixed, but you'll get the idea. Watermarks are the protection that uh, footage houses uh, do to make sure you don't steal when, you, when you're hoping to license the stuff. So we've been plowing about it, and it, it seems to me that we have a world in which we descend too quickly, too fastly, and at our peril into specialism. Mm -hmm. And here is a man who wanted to know everything. I mean, he literally wanted to know everything. He wanted to appreciate the perfection of nature. He wanted to understand the imperfection of human beings. He wanted to love the drop of dew on a single 
blade of grass. He wanted to look at the, the unbelievable design of the atom and the solar system that bear similarities. He wanted to invest his painting and his scientific inquiries in which I don't think he saw a difference. You know, everything we do now is in siloed, you know? We, we make films about music, well, it's country music. It isn't jazz or it isn't rock or it isn't folk. There's no, it's just convenience and commerce that suggests this. And unfortunately, often in the academy, we also tend to ensilo things at our peril when we understand that the great gift is the breadth of human knowledge that makes the connections between mathematics and drawing, that makes the connection between botany and, mm -hmm. and music, that makes these sort of, we'd call it interdisciplinary connect connections. And I think what, what Leonardo reaffirmed in me was this um, love of the curiosity of, of, of learning things. I mean, he's, he's something. Maybe we're, we're told by scientists that we use 10% of our brain. Mm -hmm. He's using 75%. And, you know, thanks to you, I, I really am interested in somebody who is, who's doing that. And, and that's it. Well, your, your company was called Florentine Film. Well, now so we're home free. Yeah. Hard uh, push to rock uphill. But at that dinner, uh, one of the things we discussed, as you've alluded to, was my view of why he's like Franklin, is that there are three people in history who tried to know everything, everything. possible about every subject that was knowable. Aristotle, Ben Franklin, and Leonardo da yes. Vinci. And when I was uh, studying his deluge drawings and you yeah. know, with this horrible things, which are in the film, this, the demons in his head, Delius, I asked the curator at Windsor, was he doing that as a work of art or as a work of science? And the curator said, I don't think Leonardo would have made that distinction. Yeah. And that's why here at Tulane, we try to make sure that people double major or have a sciences and an arts together. I, I think that we see, and he reminds us all the time, that um, there's nothing binary. Like binary is what we invent and superimpose. You know, red state, blue state, young, old, male, female, mm -hmm. gay, straight, black, white, rich, poor, north, south, east, west. These are all superimpositions. Mm -hmm. and, and what you are left with if, if somehow these become tired and old is, is some sort of um, evaporation. He's also interested in, you know, right. how Somato, water gets up he and called it. Yeah. yeah. How you, right, how you, how you get to places where the distinctions are invisible and everything is united. And so we, we, we think of this in a scientific pursuit as finding the theory of everything, the string theory that connects all things together. But his is much broader and more encompassing because it has to do with human dimensions and things that don't fit neatly into boxes. When I worked on the jazz series, Wynton Marsalis said to me, sometimes a thing and the opposite of a thing are true at the same time. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing in science that can do that. Everything in science, one and one, has to equal two. But actually the thing that we, that animates us in our intellectual pursuits, in our lives, in our loves, in our faith, in our art, is when one and one equals three. And I think that Leonardo profoundly, from a very early age, sort of understood this. And, and let's also understand He's an outlier, even in his own time. This is an illegitimately born, born out of wedlock, gay man, who is arguably, I'd suggest, the man of the last millennium. He's named after, he can't be named after the uh, normal uh, names of his family, of his father, Sir Piero, Guido, and other things. Uh, 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 that was, as we say in the film. So he's given another name, Leonardo, who is a, a saint, but it's a saint of freedom. And I see, and this is how I get back, I've decided and I told people and they go, but Ken, he's not American. I go, I think he may be the original American. Wow, <laughs> because good he idea. So, he's so, so, so firmly and forcefully about freedom and living his life the way he wants. And as you know, I mean, most of you, he's considered one of the great painters, whether you think Rembrandt is or somebody else is, it doesn't really matter. But he has fewer than 20 paintings, mm. and half of them are incomplete. I mean, one of them is the most famous painting in the world, but the, that's... That's something, 
And the, the fact that he's not finishing is telling you a little bit about the human project itself and his own biographical arc, which is thin on details, mm -hmm. has in it this sort of relentless pursuit of the perfect patron that will allow him to do what he wants to do. And he finally finds that at the end of his life, and it's a Frenchman of all people, not an Italian duke. But one of the things that relates him to New Orleans and places of great cradles of creativity is the fact that, as you say, he was didn't fit in as a kid right. in a tiny village of Vinci. But when he leaves and goes to the town of Florence and becomes Leonardo of Vinci, uh, even though he, somebody doesn't fit in, they embrace him, the That's Medici. Right. And they don't make him just fit into one silo. He's the engineer. He's learning from Brunelleschi how to do the dome, but he's also learning the art of perspective because you know, the Ottoman Empire has fallen. They've brought, in, they've brought uh, algebra right. into Florence, and he's painting, you know, the world's greatest paintings. Let's, um, yeah, if you so, don't mind, show us a few yeah, clips. So, and, once again, let me just give you the one little caveat. This is, it's locked, which means we're not editing anymore, but we have to do sound mixing, which takes weeks and weeks and weeks. We just locked last month, so it's nine weeks of sound editing. Also, there is watermark on some of the footage that we haven't yet paid the licensing fee for. You'll look through this in two seconds. Um, but just to say that the narrator is Keith David, a well-known actor that we've used as a narrator many, many times. And the voice of Leonardo is Adriano Giannini. Now, uh, Giancarlo Giannini, with the passing of Marcello Mastroianni, is now the dean of, uh, of Italian actors, and his son, also an actor, uh, voices Leonardo. But everything is it. We've, I've, I've mounted three clips on the first tranche we're going to look at, and then if there's time, we'll look at another little clip. So this is from the introduction, and then we're going to jump. The introduction should need no intro. And then there's um, a particularly beautiful painting that he paints relatively early on that Walter uh, uh, really likes, too, about a woman named Cecilia Gallarali. And then um, we'll just deal with some of the more scientific stuff with flight, and then later on, if there's time, on water. So the first, the first clip. One of the things you'll note is that so much of it comes from the notebooks. And we're so fortunate that more than 7,200 pages of his notebooks extant, and on them, you can see his mind dancing with nature, even as he does, as you show in the film, dissect the human face to figure out what muscles move the eyeball and which of those muscles are connected to the lips as he's painting what will be the world's most famous smile. So he makes a painting of a well-to-do Florentine silk merchant, a young mother of five who's 22 or 20 three years old and he never delivers it. He keeps it and he travels when he finds the perfect patron. He carries it and a handful of other paintings up and over the Alps uh, to where he's going to spend his last days in France. But after he dies, you know, we, we have to remember that very few people understood who he was. He, he wasn't, he didn't paint the Sistine Chapel. His didn't do sculptures per se that were standing in front of the Signoria and in, in Florence, as Michelangelo's David is. Um, he doesn't have so many paintings that are scattered around. In fact, his two most famous paintings, one he sort of sequestered, the others in a refectory, the dining room of a monastery just outside of Milan, The Last Supper. So he's really lost for many, many years, but it is the fact that all of these codex exist, that he has these thousands and thousands of pages of observations and drawings merged together. And he's left-hander, and I'm a left-hander, and you know what it's like to smudge something. He teaches himself to, to write backwards. This is mirror script. It's not really writing backwards. It's writing backwards, but in mirror script. So the D goes that way, and it's, it's mind-blowing to think that all of this is there in this thing. And he's... He's pondering this, and, and the, what we were speaking about earlier, Walter, is so central to your question, which is 
the scientific person dissects the face and understands the workings of the musculature, whatever it might be. He studies all of that and more. And yet, as one of his great admirers shortly after his death said of the Mona Lisa, he's rhapsodizing about, I think it's Vasari, he's rhapsodizing about her face. And he then just drops down and he said, but I'm certain that I can see in her throat the beating of her heart and the flow of the blood. Mm -hmm. And I promise you, I hope that when our film mm -hmm. is done, that you won't ever have a question or a joke or anything about the enigmatic smile. Because of these intentions of the mind, you begin to see, in the case of Cecile Gallerali, who's a teenage concubine of Ludovico Sforza, the Duke of Milan, called El Moro, you know, you'll, you'll have a sense that she's being kept, and there he is off, but all that stuff, but if you take together the, the, um, the Virgin of the Rocks, which you know very, very well, which is Mary sort of trying to restrain uh, a baby Moses who has prophesized the, um, the, uh, not Moses. Whom Maybe Jesus. No, no, no. Jesus, oh, St. John the Baptist. St. John, John, excuse me, St. John the Baptist is, mm -hmm. is trying to restrain uh, him from getting to her son because she knows, as everyone knows through all time, that he is the son of God and must endure the passion. He must be killed. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, the baby Jesus is totally into it, has accepted his fate, is in fact blessing John the Baptist. And her left hand is moving down attempting to reach her son, but there's an angel that God has put in the way. So this is a very familiar scene, the scene of John the Baptist or Christ or angels or the Annunciation, all of these things that everybody's painting. Only he has let Mary retain the maternal instincts at the same time there's the spiritual imperative that she has to both lose him and she doesn't want to lose him. So, her, so in the midst of this religious ecstasy of this moment is also a, just the simple mother's love for a child. It is so moving when you can approach the paintings that he'd done and understand. I mean, as you saw and dissected and th with the ermine in their eyes, it's exactly as Walter says when you see it up close. Well, as you say, he's able to come up with this ability to make paintings into narrative. That's right. You talk about it with uh, uh, Virgin of the Rocks and all the things happening. Certainly in The Last Supper, right. it is a, it's almost like a Ken Burns documentary. It's I, moving. I, I, and it begins with, one of you shall betray me, and you see it rippling across. This is exactly right. In some ways, you sort of feel with The Last Supper that he invented cinema, didn't mm -hmm. know it. But he actually said... Well, he invented the Ken Burns thing, which is <laughs> the, a still picture can become a narrative. He, you begin to realize that normally, and Last Suppers are again in part of the staple of things, and people do them, and it's limited because you want to see all their faces, so you have to arrange them on a table that's this wide, mm -hmm. kind of like the, the head table at a banquet. And um, everybody's got an expression, they're kind of frozen. And he's got that, he's got these limitations, but it has a kind of geometric perfection to it. It's going right to Christ in the center. And he said this, and so what is rippling out are all the various responses. Judas, his neck muscles are taut, and he knows about the anatomy, so he knows exactly what that means, and other people can't believe it. There's stages of disbelief, and so you feel like, my goodness, I'm not living in a painting that I'm up and regarding and owning in terms of time, he still controls the time. And it's, it's several seconds there. And so it has this kind of dynamism that you rarely see in any kind of painting. Even later, as we move into more modern periods, um, you know, even the nude descending a staircase, you, you understand it's the attempt at apparent time, but there's an emotional depth and profundity to The Last Supper that is just worth the trip to see. When people ask me what was the salient trait, one, one of the answers I give is curiosity. Yes. That he wanted to understand everything. You see it in the notebooks. He has a list of things every week. Every, that he, yeah. Like, you know, how do they walk on water in Flanders? How do they move the locks? And, uh, you know, and my favorite is describe the tongue of the woodpeckers yeah. on one of those. Like, who gets up and wants to know what a tongue... But Leonardo, you open a wood... 
but that curiosity helps with the painting for a while. Like, why is the sky blue? That's in his notebook. But after a while, you realize he doesn't need to know that to paint the Mona Lisa. He's just driven by pure curiosity. I, I agree completely, and it is a stunning one because we say this and we throw this around, but going back to this kind of unification of what is the curiosity in service to? So he, you know, is in an era in which most of the paintings are religious or of rich people or whatever. He, he does the first landscape in Western art. Mm -hmm. um, he's curious, he does the first aerial, as you point out in our film, the first aerial photograph, painting, drawing. For warfare. Of, of Imola, which is a, 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 a town in, in Romagna, kind of the warring eastern provinces east of, of, of Florence. And it's, as you point out, uh, it's better than any of the weapons that he's designed also. He's t completely repulsed by war, but he's invented all of these things to ingratiate himself to this patron, particularly Ludovico Sforza in Milan. I can do this, I can do battlements, we can build bridges, we can have uh, mangonels and, and trebuchets and catapults and all of these sorts of things. And, oh, by the way, I might be an okay painter, down, way down on the list of a letter we don't even know if he sent to uh, Il Moro. But he's, the power is in the information. He understands that information is the best weapon. Mm -hmm. As you point out in the film, it's a really wonderful moment, and that's it. What is the question that you're asking? And this kind of unified sense of the deepest humanity that we have makes him utterly contemporary to this moment. I mean, right now, this afternoon, at Tulane University in New Orleans mm -hmm. at a book festival. Mm -hmm. He speaks directly to the questions that animate us in a way that I am, I, I find mind-blowing. And the ultimate of all questions is how do I fit in, which That's, is a misfit outsider. Yes. He can answer it better. And it's how to, and he uses both the science and art in the greatest drawing ever made, Vitruvian Man. Yes. You know, the nude guy doing jumping jacks. And right, circle. squaring it's the circle. It's all about two squaring the circle, which he's trying to do, because that helps him do the math of squaring the circle. But it connects the macrocosm, as he calls it, the tiniest things, to the cosmic. Uh, this, is, this is exactly it. As above, so below are some religious dynamics put it, and, and the atom and the solar system do bear a very similar and profound design. And I think this is the first human being that isn't sort of straight, sort of religious, spiritual philosophers, and he is that too, who come to some understanding of that and is asking the question, who am I? What am I here for? What happened before? Who was I? The essential part of me before, and what will be the essential part of me afterwards? And this is a question that is sounded day in and day out in a life that betrays, as you know, very little biographical details. We know he's arrested on sodomy charges. He gets off because one of the guys that arrested with him is a rich family man. We know his mother comes to visit, and he hasn't mentioned his mother once. And then. In the next passage, he's listing the expenses of her funeral. Mm -hmm. And just down to the salty that went to the candles, the salty that went to the beer, the salty that went to the... And out of this totality of opacity is also works of art that permit the rest of us to actually wish to know what the difference between using 10% of our brain and 75 might be. Wow. Ken Burns, thank you so much. Thank you.